All right, ladies and gentlemen, again, welcome, welcome back for another edition of Grateful Sunday. I appreciate you guys coming over so much. Shout out to all the deadheads. So uh, this is Polyponic. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Uh, this video is How the Grateful Dead Changed Live Music Forever. Wow, this should be very, very interesting, man. Hope it's a lot of detail. I'm just here to listen and learn. Try not to stop the video that uh, and nothing like that. I just want to really take all this in. Again, appreciate you guys coming over. Hopefully everything goes smoothly so this can be up for you guys to watch. All right, so we ain't going to waste no more time. Let's jump right into it. Few bands, if any, have ever perfected the live music experience like the Grateful Dead. Right. In a 30-year career spanning more than 2,000 shows, the Dead forever changed the sound of live music. They toured relentlessly, building up one of the most dedicated fan followings in all of music, and they even encouraged that following to record performances, developing an entire culture around taping shows and trading them. But one of the things that stood out most about the Dead's legendary touring career was the sound system they used for a brief glorious period in 1974. Yeah, Many know yeah. that sound system as the wall of sound. Let's take a closer look. Okay. Because we know this from the other video plus my Grateful Dead movie I reacted to. To tell the story of the wall of sound, we need to tell the story of Owsley Stanley, one of its creators. Known to many as Bear, Owsley's connections with the Dead began in early 1966. He worked as the band's first sound man, and even designed the first incarnation of the band's iconic Steal Your Face logo as a way to mark and keep their gear identifiable. In the early days of the Dead, Bear would record the band any time they rehearsed or performed, in a constant attempt to improve their performances and his mixing of their sound. So and while dope. his sound work with the Dead was incredible, Bear's real fame came from something more nefarious. In the mid-1960s, Bear became the most famous LSD chef in the world. He ran a lab out of Richmond, California, where he produced hundreds of thousands of doses of LSD. His stuff was notoriously clean and high quality, which made him and his product a pillar of the entire psychedelic movement. Stanley became a countercultural hero. One newspaper title infamously called him an LSD millionaire, which inspired the title of the dad song, LSD Millionaire. Alice While the Dead and their followers saw Stanley as a hero, the authorities didn't quite feel the same, and Stanley's infamy ended up landing him in jail for two years, between 1970 and 1972. During this stretch, the Grateful Dead were working hard to obtain a better live sound. But this wasn't easy. You see, in the late 1960s, electric music had advanced to a point where it was far surpassing any audio technology available. Mm. Most bands were still playing through jury-rigged PA systems of the day, not much better than the speakers in a high school auditorium. And these speakers just couldn't keep up with the sound. The result was songs that came out muddied and distorted. And on top of this, onstage monitors were in their infancy, so musicians could rarely hear what they were playing on stage. This provided a problem for the dead, who were obsessive about their sound, right. and they couldn't stand how their live performances didn't capture the real heart of the band. Check out this recording of St. Stephen from 1969. Yeah, so, uh, when I watched that movie, the Grateful Dead movie, one of the craziest things was Jerry talking about him, uh, throwing, uh, fell down the stairs because he got so mad <laughs> about the sound or something like that. And then he, he said when he went back to listen to it, it, it actually sound, uh, after a few listens, it sound pretty good. So it's like he, he literally threw him down the stairs for nothing. <laughs> I was like, damn, Jerry. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> The point of the song still gets across, but it's missing some of the nuance and crisp clarity heard in Dave Glasser's mix. What just happened? The biggest change that he... 
So the sound cut out. I'm wondering if did something happen with the audio not being able to be played. All right, just letting y'all know when that little sound part go out, that's what happened. It seems simple at first glance. He put the PA system behind the band. It seems like an obvious change as it allowed the musicians to hear the exact same thing as the audience. But there was only one problem. Have you ever put a microphone in front of a speaker? If you have, your ears probably still haven't forgiven you. The shriek you heard was feedback, the result of feeding an output signal back into its input. Stanley worked with the music company Alembic to find a solution to this problem. They cracked it by placing a pair of microphones next to each other, one for the singer and one for the ambient noise on stage. That ambient noise was then fed through an amplifier that subtracted it from the vocal microphone. In doing so, only the vocals came through and the feedback was removed. This is actually the same theory that would go on to be used in noise-canceling headphones. Sound and the only really reason it sounded so good was because of the brilliant innovation that was the wall of sound. Another bare touch was to give each instrument its own section of speakers in the wall. Wow. Doing this gave unprecedented control over every instrument and ensured a crystal clear sound for every layer of the song. It was unprecedented. Yeah, I, I like, I, I completely understand like why it's so important uh, to listen to live dead, you know, it just, it's another layer on it, you know, versus like the studio. Instead of running through a mixing board, each microphone had its own volume control. This meant the musicians themselves could mix as they play if they weren't happy with the sound. Mm. The scale of the system, as many as 600 speakers weighing a total of 75 tons, let audience members as far away as 500 feet from the stage hear the band as if the dead were playing on the porch next door. Wow. While Bear is behind a lot of the wall, he didn't work alone. Some of the other engineers responsible for the sound included Dan Healy and Sparky Raising from the Dead's own crew, along with Alembic's aces Ron Wickersham and Rick Turner. One of the greatest feats that this team pulled off was making a speaker system that was loud, but clear. The speakers could go as high as 127 decibels, but the system wasn't about loudness or noise. Its focus was fidelity. Someone standing right next to the wall of sound wouldn't feel blown away, but would rather remark on the crystal clear sound from the gargantuan setup. And the wall of sound was constantly evolving, constantly striving to improve. But this masterclass in sound came with a price. Setting up the system took an entire day, and after each show, yeah. the crew would work well into the early hours of the morning to take it down. Despite the unprecedented and massive success of the experiment, transport... Yeah, so that's another clip I've seen from the uh, Grateful Dead movie, man. I was like, man, look at all those speakers. This look crazy. Imagine just being there. It just sounds amazing, especially, I mean, he said 500 feet back, feet back but if you're in the front row, <laughs> man. It became too costly to continue. By late 1974, the dead had dismantled the wall of sound. After taking it down, they even took a short hiatus from live touring. When they returned in 1976, the wall was nowhere to be seen, replaced by a more practical sound system. But to this day, the Grateful Dead's wall of sound recordings are revered as some of the finest of their career. Their drive for sonic perfection changed the musical world. It opened up new avenues for live performances and laid the groundwork for many of the massive speaker systems used in touring today. The Wall of Sound is one of the many triumphs in the Grateful Dead's career and one of the most important parts of live music history. Mm. Really, really, really good uh, video, man. I don't know, like I said, I don't know, but I feel like a lot of you already knew this, but Again, I'm watching to, to, to see for myself. I mean, it's probably going to be a lot of stuff that you guys already know. But um, wanted to check this out. Um, but like I said, this was really, 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 really good information. I felt like I needed to know. Because even when I watched the Grateful Dead movie, they didn't really go into that much detail about the wall of sound. But that was really, really good, man. It, it, it makes you understand more like growing up, like you guys listening to Grateful Dead, going to their shows, how important. Comment below, how important was that wall of sound to y'all? And how, how many of y'all were able to experience that live? How about that? But hey, that was really good, man. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of music that was being played in here. 
hopefully everything goes smoothly for you guys to be able to watch because I want to get this video up for y'all. But if not, just go to the very first comment. I will leave a link there for the uh, full reaction. All right. Again, appreciate y'all coming over and watching for this grateful Sunday. And shout out to all the deadheads. Peace out.